right. Nathan Holiday on your left. Jund versus Twin is how we kick off the Season 2 Invitational. Scalding Tarn is how Holiday will begin things. For Duke, it is a raging ravine. Holiday is going to sacrifice that fetch line. He's down to 19 for the moment. Could be 17 if he'd like it to be, but that steam fence will enter the battlefield tapped. And when we get to the sideboard, I'm very excited because I actually got to sit next to Reed yesterday as he was in the tournament hall a little bit earlier. Building a sideboard, it was a pretty fascinating process to watch him build this deck, which obviously he's played several times in tournaments. An island for Holiday and a passing of the turn. We head back Duke's way. Holiday does have a decent amount of twin effects. There's so many different ways that you can build this deck, but he's got four to see Rex arcs and then two Pester Mites. Doing a check for Kiki Jiki, you're not gonna find that card. You, of course, will find the Splinter Twins in the deck. There are four of those. But some people really lean heavily on the combo package. Some look to play a more fair game. Holiday looking to play, I suppose, a more fair game if you believe that Snapcaster Mage is a fair card. Well, it, it, it's part of the deck being able to sideboard into just a regular control deck when he doesn't feel like the combo is good. And this is one of those kind of matchups. Redo playing with Abrupt Decay, with Terminate. Going to be very hard for Nathan to execute the combo. A remand on Dark Confidant, a passing of the turn by Duke over to Holiday. Holiday just draws his card, plays a Cavern of Souls. We'll get confirmation on what it is naming. That is a one of Cavern of Souls in his deck as we head back to Reed. Holiday has gone with Wizard for his Cavern of Souls. Duke with a Verdant Catacombs, and there's Dark Confidant, and I imagine Reed is hoping that he's not dead. This is the thing about Twin when you play against it. It's so scary because we could just have an Exarch and then a Twin, but it's just a Lightning Bolt to take care of the Confidant. The interesting thing when you're playing against Twin is, you know, when is it appropriate just to tap out and say, I hope you don't have it? Well, I think it's very important against a deck like Twin to get out in front on the first couple turns of the game, because eventually it's not just about being able to beat the combo, you also have to beat things like Snapcaster Mage plus Remand, or Cryptic Command. So if you hold up mana for the entire game, Twin can kind of pivot and play a traditional control game. So it's important for Reed to get something on the board in the first couple turns, and then hold up his shields of removal spells or whatever else he has to protect himself from the combo. Duke is going to go for a scavenging use. That will get hit by a remand from Holiday as well. Duke with a little bit of mana issues. Nathan, too. Nathan draws a dispel. His draw off the remand was a Vendillion Click. You can see Holiday's hand. Two Splinter Twins, Cryptic Command, Vendillion Click, and Dispel. All very powerful cards. Yep, and, and that's the evolution of Blue Red Twin. It's gone away from, you know, the Kiki Jikis on top of the four Splinter Twins and four Pester Mites to more of a Blue Red control deck that happens to have the combo woven into it. Duke is going to try Tarmogoyf this time. See if this resolves. And it looks like it will. I'm going to do a graveyard check to see how big the Goyf is. Looks to be a 3-4. Holiday on the end step is going to play Vendillion Click. See if he wants to target himself or Reed. He's going to target himself. Reveal a Splinter Twin. That'll go to the bottom. Mystery card coming from the Vendillion Click. Reed pointing out that you do need to draw. Now he'll draw for his turn. Nice guy, Reed Duke, at it again. What a surprise. Two Pester Mites now in Holiday's hand, along with a copy of Splinter Twins. So in theory, the combo is there. Yep. I, I, Nathan is still without land number four, and even if he draws it, there's no guarantee it produces red mana for the Splinter Twin. But having the other piece of the combo is nice. As you did mention, there is no guarantee that it'll produce that red mana. He does have a card like Desolate Lighthouse in his main, in his main deck, also a copy of Tectonic Edge as well. A couple islands, I imagine. Yeah, four of them. Looks like Mendelian Click's going to come into the red zone. Duke's going to go down to 17. We'll see if there will be a follow-up here or not. Twin players always posturing. Don't want to give away too much information, but I do have the combo. I'm setting it up. Here's what's in my hand. We're going to have a Pestermite, it looks like, on the upkeep. And this is what makes Twin so interesting, because this could just be a very innocent, I just have a 2-1. Yep. It's not a big deal. And Holiday actually wants this to be targeted by a removal spell. We'll see. And there is a Lightning Bolt. That Raging Ravine is going to be tapped anyway, so Reed will take that off of the table. Tarmogoyf on the battlefield is a 3-4 at this point. And Nathan's just got to test the waters at some point anyway. Reed's very likely to cast whatever removal spell he can in response right away. And if Reed does nothing there, it may be a sign that the coast is clear. Looks like Bloodstained Mire is going to be the land here for Duke as he's weighing his options. Also has a copy of Huntmaster of the Fells in hand. One copy in the main, one in the board. 
Looks to be a popular choice this weekend, as it is very good in the mirror and against other thoughts these decks. Very solid against Burn as well. This as far as main deck threats you could be playing. But not at its best in this matchup, that's for yeah. sure. Good against removal spells, Lillian of the Veil. We forget just how dominant that card was in standard. It seems so long ago. Yeah, but it was definitely a key player. And, and Reed's list is sprinkled with cards from old standard formats that were dominant players and have sort of fallen off the map a little bit. You see Olivia Voltaren in the sideboard. We'll get to that in a little bit. A Corsair Crufix. Ah, very nice. For the Catacombs, we sacrifice. Duke goes down to 16. Getting a basic land in Forest. We'll see what the follow-up will be here for Duke again. We know he has Scavenging Ooze in hand. So you may have some interest in deploying that this turn. And you can also see the Abrupt Decay that Reed has in hand. And that's a major player in this particular matchup. Now, he's going to use the Decay right now to get Vendillion Click off of the table. And now he's going to sacrifice another fetch land. It'll be a Swamp. And perhaps we have a Tasker on the way. One in the main deck. His plays up until this point would indicate that was the case. Normally, you'd want to hold the Abrupt Decay and cast the Terminate, but Reed wants to get this out on the table and only has so much of the right mana to work with. Reed's entire graveyard is gone in exchange for a 4-5, stopping ground the draw there for Holiday. That is the fourth land and the second source of red mana for the Splinter Twin in his hand. The question is, can he get things assembled now? Does Duke have any removal left in his hand? The Stomping Ground does not help with the Cryptic Command that's in Nathan's hand, too. And Nathan's under a very fast clock here. He may be obligated just to go for the kill. I believe he has to spell backup. Looks to be the case. And, you know, that might be enough for Nathan to go for it, given how much pressure he's under right now. Duke draws a card. You can see he does have a Termin in his hand, also a copy of Maelstrom Pulse. We know about the Scavenging use. Looks like he's ready to go to the attack step. He's going to come across here for seven. Holiday's going to go down to seven. And because of Reed's colored mana situation, he could not cast Abrupt Decay last turn. It had to be Terminate. We'll see if this costs him. This is a Pestermite. We'll see how Holiday wants to use it. Does he want to untap one of his lands or tap one of Duke's? That Black Cleave Cliffs certainly looks like a nice, juicy target for Pestermite's tap. Yeah, I mean, it's, it enables a lot of different removal spells. So see what's going on right now. Now for Holiday, drawing a land is a big deal. He picked up a copy of Serum Visions. And again, Nathan was hoping for a land there so he could go for the combo with Dispel back up. But look at the pressure he's under. Only at seven life. I think he's going to have to go for it and hope that there's no removal spell. Yep, there is Splinter Twin. That's a tournament to take care of that, and this will take care of the game. Reed Duke is going to win game number one here over Nathan Holiday. Jund up a game over Blue Red Twin. Assisted in large part because of Nathan Mulliganing so far. but. I'll land off the top there, and he might have game one in spite of a mulligan to five. We'll take a look at the sideboards, and we will start with Holiday and his twin deck. Now, things get interesting here because it is pretty tough to resolve twin, kind of the combo portion of this deck against a deck like Jun, which really wants to stop you. So as a result, a lot of players go towards kind of these weird sideboards where they board out the combo, and they board in cards like Karanos, God of Storms, and who knows what else. You take a look at Holiday's sideboard. He's got a negated a spell and a roast, along with a copy of Rending Volley. But you also find two copies of Karanos, a copy of Teferi, Major Zalfir, a Jace Architect of Thought, a Spell Sky, two Anger of the Gods, two Ancient Grudge, and two copies of Blood Moon. So a lot of options here for Nathan. I love all the stuff that allows Nathan to go long here. I think you want the Jace, the two copies of Karanos. I think even the Teferi is reasonable, even though it's not really a counterspell matchup. I still think it's powerful in playing that sort of game. Roast, Negate. I, I don't know if he necessarily wants the extra copy of Dispel. Wouldn't surprise me to see Nathan go to Blood Moon here as well. Reed does have some basics, but a lot of his draws are not going to be able to play through that card. And I think you're going to see the combo mostly booted out of Nathan's deck. He may keep it a little bit of it. You know, Pesterbite on his own just as a threat is not the worst thing in the world against Jun. So you may see the Pesterbites kept in and maybe one or two Splinter Twins. But I think for the most part, Nathan's just going to be cutting out the combo and converting more into a Blu-ray control deck. Oh, what do we see for the Duke? One copy of Thoughtseize, one copy of Duress, one copy of Ancient Grudge, one copy of Huntmaster of the Fells, a Grim Lava Mancer, an Olivia Voldaren, a Grafdigger's Cage, a Choke, a Fulminator Mage, a Corsair Crufix, three copies of Kitchen Things, two copies of Shatterstorm. The cards that really stand out to me for this matchup are the Thoughtseize, the Duress, and the Choke. 
Uh, maybe the copy of Grim Blavamancer comes in here as well. It's a pretty good card against Pestermite, and it's just another threat if Reed feels like some of his more reactive cards aren't very efficient here. Uh, but for the most part, Reed's doing most of his work in this matchup in game one. He's got a lot of instant speed removal. He's got a lot of cheap threats, and that's a very solid mixture. But I like bringing in the extra discard spells, and uh, Choke may be able to steal a game here for Reed as well. Well, these players will shuffle up here for game number two. We will talk about, of course, Star City Games game night. Very popular promotion, thanks to you guys. And if you did notice on our lapels, we it is June, so it's time for the bunny. The bee is gone, thankfully. I'm very yeah, happy about thankful, that. Fortunately for you, uh, Game Night is a program that your stores can run. They can hold it whatever day of the week they want, run it whatever format they want to. We send out these pins and foils every month, and it's just an incentive to get players in the store for some fun and friendly magic. This is the June kit here. We've already announced the July kit as well, which is the Piglet. It's too late to get signed up for July, but if you want to get signed up for the August kit, which I believe we have, at the ready, head over to starcitygames.com slash game night for more information. Get yourself these monkey pins and tokens in August. Banana beatdowns. Yep. My favorite. That monkey is going beast mode right now. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, I don't know if he's stealing them or if he's simply purchased them and you're accusing, is being careless. Hold on. You're accusing the monkey already of being a thief. I didn't say it. I'm just, well, it's a. That was certainly an accusation. Uh, property in the wild is already a, a weird thing. But <laughs> regardless, August is monkey month. StarCityGames.com slash game night for more information. I like that monkey. So I was watching Reed while he was building a sideboard yesterday at the tournament site, and I saw him immediately. He's got his deck laid out, you know, whatever. And he's writing one Thoughtseize, one Duress, one Ancient Grudge, one Hunt Master of the Fells, one Grove Law Mancer. And I asked him. A lot him, of fun ofs. I asked him, do you just kind of have a list of cards that you always have a copy of in your Jun list? And he said, essentially, yeah. He, he knows what cards he wants that do a, a variety of things in a variety of matchups. A lot of them overlap. A lot of them are bad to draw on multiples. And so it's sort of diversifying his portfolio a little bit. He asked about the one choke, and I advised him that I was pro choke. You were pro, you were pro choke. <laughs> Does not surprise me. That's your kind of card right there. We also, Reed and I, were, were discussing further about the choke. Usually, as you know, I'm kind of a stickler for black border cards and playing the oldest versions of cards. I'm a big fan of the white border choke, because if you're going to do someone dirty, it might as well be with the with the what was it ninth edition or I think it is part of ninth edition. It's yeah. pretty rough, so you got to get the whiteboard chokes. Yeah, really let them know where they stand. Yep, it's of, really ugly. Yeah, just let them know that I'm throwing sand in your eyes. <laughs> That's how I'm playing. Oh, eighth. <laughs> it's eighth edition. Excuse, Excuse me. me. <laughs> Look at that! Yeah, that's that's truly horrible. That is a card that's going to produce a concession in multiple ways. Yeah. I'm not going to stare. I'm not staring at that thing for ten minutes while your Tarmogoyf kills me. Yeah, not no, not like that. When it's in the it's in the sleeves, the black sleeves, and the white border is just yeah everywhere for you to see. No, this, thank you. This is what I think of you. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. Cards they speak volumes, even though they can't say anything. Yeah, it's not. It's not even like the Tempest Choke is that expensive. No. You know, I just want to do this. Holiday will be on the play here. Let's see if he can keep a seven card. He has at least one peak in his hand. Peak a card that twin players do play instead of Gataxian Probe. So I'm curious as to why, but actually finding out the information on their turn can be useful. Plays a little bit better with Snapcaster Mage, because the deck's, the deck's in the market for as much instance as possible. And Gitaxian Pro, well, your opponent still has a draw step. It's good to know at the moment you actually want to go off what their hand looks like. The players know the options that are available. Everyone knows Gitaxian Pro is a legal card, but Holiday opting to go with Peak, and you'll oftentimes find at least one, sometimes two Peaks in, twins decks, yep. in Twin Decks. Excuse me. What I'm interested to see this game is how much respect does Reed show for the possibility of Blood Moon. Just because the Blue-Red Twin has it doesn't necessarily mean they're bringing it against you, though it's most likely. Uh, sometimes having to fetch for basics does muck up a little bit of what read sequencing looks like or if he can put together multiple spells on the same turn. And I'm interested to see how much does he go out of his way to fetch for basics and preemptively play around Blood Moon. It's an Inquisition of Kozilek here from the Duke. Holiday has a desolate lighthouse in his hand. That's his other land. You see the grip, a remand, a spell snare, a snapcaster mage, a peak, and a Vendillion click. Nathan, oh, pretty good hand. Very solid hand, obviously light on mana. And Nathan's saying, uh, if you want to take the peak out of his hand and hope to, you know, stall me out on lands, I'm happy playing that game. He's got a lot of draw steps. He's got a remand to protect himself. And if Reed wants to take one of the higher impact cards out of his hand, well, Nathan gets to cycle the peak and get a shot at land drops. 
Most, most often, I feel like the Jun player is well served just taking Snapcaster Mage. It's the most powerful card in the Twin decks, early on at least, in these attrition-based games. And if there isn't something striking you as something you should be taking, I think you're better off erring on the side of just getting Snapcaster Mage out of the hand. That's what we did. Holiday going to go down to 17, fetch up a Steam Vents untapped. Cast Peak right down Duke's hand of a Lightning Bolt to Treetop Village. An Abrupt Decay, a Liliana of the Veil, a Black Cleave Cliffs, and a Stomping Ground. So this is a, uh, uh, this hand right here is a very good demonstration of why twin players sideboard into the control route. This is a hand that's really going to, uh, Reed's hand is something that's Nathan's really going to struggle to get the combo off against. It's multiple pieces of removal. But if he's trying to play towards Karanos, uh, Remand, Vendillion Click, his late game spells play very well against this hand of cheap removal. As Holiday draws a copy of Serum Visions off of the peak. Now he'll take a draw step for the turn. Looks like it's a copy of Deceiver Exarch. So he's getting rocking and rolling here. And now the question is, is Nathan willing to let the shields down on remand to resolve the Serum Visions and try to get to another blue source? So the answer is yes, as he draws another copy of remand. Scalding Tarn is one, Lightning Bolt is two. That's what he's looking at for the scry. I think that's a spot where had Nathan had another blue source of mana in hand, he probably would have said go this turn and held up Ravan, Serum Visions the following turn. But because he's at risk of missing a land drop and doesn't have another source of blue mana, he's got to cast it this turn and hope Reed can't do a lot to punish him next turn. Yeah, hoping for something not like a Dark Confidant, for example. Exactly. And that's why Nathan's thinking so long about the Scry. The Lightning Bolt looks pretty anemic in this set of cards, but it is a good answer to Dark Confidant if that's what Reed's play is next turn. So I think Nathan's leaving it on top. If he doesn't want it, he can shuffle it away with the Scalding Tarn he left on top. And if he does want it, he'll be happy to have it. Well, it does not look like Duke drew a Dark Confidant. He'll just play a Treetop Village and pass the turn back. Holly's going to draw that Scalding Tarn. We know that. And settling in for what looks to be a little bit of a longer game with these counter spells here. He'll pass the turn back. Duke, it looks like he picked up a copy of Scavenging Ooze. We already know about the Liliana of the Veil in hand. Mana's being pulled in a little bit of interesting directions. This here's Black Lead Cliffs. Almost forced to play that this turn. Yep. So he can try to deploy Liliana. would be surprised if this resolved. Seems like a nice remand target, and it is. And Holiday's actually going to draw the Lightning Bolt. He's going to keep that now. Have the option to maybe sacrifice away the Scalding Tarn and just drawing a mystery card, but say, you know what, I'll take this Lightning Bolt with me. Well, the combination of Lightning Bolt plus Vendillion Click gives Nathan a lot of play against the Liliana on the way back. Lightning Bolt's also an answer to Treetop Village somewhere down the line if he wants it. So I like taking the Lightning Bolt there. You see all they kind of pausing on what land to search up here, and the reason for that is because you can see the bottom card of his deck is a Blood Moon. So it would be very easy to just say, yeah, I'll just get myself a Steam Vents, duh, and move on. But, you know, if he draws a Blood Moon in this situation, I think he would want to actually play it. Yeah, and the pause there and finding a basic island and doing nothing with the blue mana is a dead giveaway to read now that Blood Moon in some number is definitely in Nathan's deck. There's no other reason for Nathan to fetch that way. Land number four is an island. Now, that's actually pretty helpful for a couple of reasons. Lands are always good. But also, now he can start activating that Desolate Lighthouse. Exactly, and if Reed is trying to sit back on a bunch of removal, Desolate Lighthouse can do a ton of work. Dougal draw. Picked up a copy of Overgrown Tomb. A little bit land heavy this game is, Reed. And Reed's deck is just way less equipped to handle drawing too many lands than Nathan. Nathan has a lot of stuff to do with mana, and he has cards like this in the Lighthouse that allow him to convert dead cards. Uh, redrawing additional lands is pretty bad for him if this game's shaping up to go on for a long time. Nathan probably considering the remand in his hand yet again. No guarantee that he has to use that, however. He's going to let Liliana resolve, it seems. The elevator's going to go up on Liliana, so both players will discard. We'll see what Holiday wants to discard in this situation. And it looks like he might actually be leaning towards Remand, which may be a touch surprising. Well, I think that he wants to leave himself with Lightning Bolt and Vendillion Click to answer the Liliana. Discarding a man, it really is just a sign of my hand is really good. Yes. That's what that means. Duke is going to play an untapped stomping ground, bluffing a Lightning Bolt. 
Though it appears he does have one in his hand. Now here is Deceiver Exarch. And that's a safer way to go around the Lightning Bolt. That's going to lock this down. Lightning Bolt may go after the Liliana, knock it down to one, and then Deceiver XR can finish it off. And this is why you're seeing the sequences, so Reed can't use a Lightning Bolt in hand to break this all up. Yep. The Exarch's going to tag the Liliana, finish that off. The Liliana did some nice work there. Got a lot of cards out. Yeah. It's not a bad sequence for Reed, but uh, Nathan now has a Deceiver XR in play, potentially threatening the combo at a moment's notice. If he left any of those pieces in, Reed at least has to respect that possibility. It's also a blocker for Treetop Village. Yep. What's well, interesting here, Holiday may be thinking about not playing this land because he has Lighthouse in play. The Sulfur Falls that he just deployed. There are a lot of decisions we made when you were playing a twin deck. Exactly. And I, I think at the end of the day, you know, Nathan is trying to get to Karanos. He needs the land number five at some point, so might as well play it. Here's him dealing clicking the draw step. Reed will show off the grip of Rupt Decay times two, a scavenging who's a lightning bolt and a forest. So Reed is through maybe that little bit of mana flood that he was experiencing. Now, Holiday's going to get a good look at that hand, decide if he even wants to take something. Note that Reed just let the Vanilla Click resolve. Could have maybe fire off a Lightning Bolt or an Abrupt Decay, but says, you know what? If you want to pick one of these cards, feel free. I've got plenty of answers. Yeah, Reed's got so many removal spells that he wants to leave his mana available. In the event that Nathan puts something on the bottom, he could draw something bigger and potentially play it. I think Nathan probably lets his hand go. I think he's got a spell there for the Scavenging Goose. I don't think there's a lot of value to be gained by taking any of the removal spells. And it doesn't look like Nathan's going to select much of anything at this point. Yeah, there's not a hole to pick in this hand. If he didn't have an answer to the Scavenging Ooze, maybe he takes it there. But because he does, in the spell snare in hand, might as well just allow Reed to be glutted on removal spells while you start activating your Desolate Lighthouse and getting to Karanos. That's a hand where it looks like Nathan maybe is supposed to take something, but I like just leaving it there. There's no way for, for Nathan to work his way through all the removal spells for the time being. So let Reed have all of it, prevent him from finding proactive cards. And Reed's got a pretty nice turn lined up here where he can play Ooze. He can abrupt decay and lightning bolt and kill a bunch of things. Or he can just say, you know what, let's get a little bit aggressive. Fire up the old treetop village here, leave abrupt decay mana open. And see what you can do around that. Looks like Vendillion Click and Treetop are going to trade here. And maybe not. Yeah, Nathan would be thrilled to trade one of his creatures with the treetop village and just glut Reed with the removal spells, but uh, Reed did put his shields down to die into a Splinter Twin there. Yep. I think I, I think Reed's position here probably is there's probably zero copies of Splinter Twin. Maybe there's one, and it's just not worth making a lot of effort to play around it. Again, that's what's very difficult about playing as a twin deck is how many copies of these cards do they have in their deck? And Reed playing against Desolate Lighthouse and knowing that there's cards like Karanos hanging out, he has to get aggressive. Yep. You know, he, he has to take some risk here, try to deal as much damage as possible, because the longer this game goes on, the more it favors Nathan. There's an Abrupt Decay on the Deceiver XR. Treetop Village is looking to trample over for a little bit more damage, but Lightning Bolt, the peel there from Holiday, gets set off the table. We're going to get a Lighthouse activation. Snapcaster Mage with the draw. See what he wants to discard. And that's why Reed has to get aggressive here, because Nathan's got the powerful blue cards and Desolate Lighthouse. Reed's got to be the aggressor. Snapcaster Mage now remand in hand as we head back Duke's way. Maybe it's time for that scavenging news. Looks like it is. Will Holiday have a response? He does have Snapcaster Mage in hand, after all. Nathan likely debating between just spell snaring it or Snapcaster plus spell snare. Looks like he will go with the Snapcaster Mage. And now he will snare that. So no Scavenging Ooze here for Reed. Scavenging Ooze is a huge, huge card in this format. A lot of decks use the Graveyard. Good against Burn. Good against anything Graveyard-centric. Good against decks with Bolt primarily as removal. Last card in as a remand. That'll put Dark Confidant away. Mystery card drawn here. And there's a Lightning Bolt to take care of the Snapcaster Mage. Now, I believe Mr. Holiday has found Tectonic Edge, along with a gold card in, Electro in Electrolyze. So a man land like Raging Ravine is now off the table here for Duke if he draws that, as Holly has the answer. And Electrolyze is just an awesome draw in this spot for Nathan, has an answer to Dark Confidant, keeps the cards coming, gives him fuel for Death of the Lighthouse. Chandra, an interesting draw here for Reed. 
If we're going to play a longer game, Chandra's great at doing that. Yes, absolutely. And this is something that I, I know you and I were at Grand Prix Detroit a couple years ago. Reed was employing this card then. Yeah, only, again, one copy in the list. Not a huge commitment, but just another powerful four-mana spell. And it's nice to have a couple permanents in your deck that are potent in, in protracted games and don't get tagged by Abrupt Decay. Not a lot of decks have efficient answers for this once it's in play. It's in play right now. We'll see how Reed wants to use it. Reveal Black Cleave Cliffs. That'll enter the battlefield tapped. And now here's a Lighthouse activation. A Mountain was the draw. A Mountain will be the discard. Holiday will draw. A copy of Roast. Not the right time for that. See if he maybe wants to activate the Lighthouse now or keep waiting. I think he's still better served waiting. He may want to cast this Electrolyze. It's just best for Nathan to wait. There's not a lot of stuff he can find immediately to make much of a difference. Here's a zero. That's an Overgrown Tomb. Nothing too impressive there from the Duke. And the zeros actually, you know, they have the ability to not be good. Finding removal spells and the like. There's a lot of misses in this kind of stage. Uh, right now, Reed really wants proactive cards. I think he'd be happy with discard spells as well. Looks like Holiday's going to fire up that Electrolyze. Take care of Dark Confidant. Send a damage Chandra's way. Draw a card. It's a copy of Serum Visions. Lightning Bolt would I be ideal here for Nathan. Stomping ground the draw. Serum Visions is not a bad place to start, however. And that's where he'll begin things on this turn. Look for Bolts or Snapcaster Mage. Yep. Picked up another copy of Serum Visions. Karanos among the cards here for the Scry. Along with Blood Moon. Okay, then. Well, Blood Moon's not very good here. Reed has fetched for his Forest and his Swamp, and then the rest of his lands become Mountains. So yep. it's not that disruptive right now. Karanos, on the other hand, is a pretty big prize. But that's really Nathan's plan in this matchup. Looks like Nathan is going to keep the Blood Moon on top. The Karanos will go underneath it. We'll, we might see Serum Visions again. We do. He knows what he's going to draw. So now it's Karanos and Remand. He'll keep those two. I think we might get that Blood Moon now. Now, Blood, Blood Moon is interesting in this situation because I agree with your assessment that Reed's mana is already pretty good with the Forest and Swamp in play. And by playing this Blood Moon, Nathan's actually shutting off his Lighthouse. Yeah. And Desolate Lighthouse feels pretty significant to me with this game shaping up to be a slow one. There's a stomping ground at passing of the turn. So now all these non basics, well, those are mountains out there. So Reed has a swamp, a forest, and a whole bunch of mountains. And for Nathan, he's got two islands a bunch, and a bunch of mountains in play. Now, Chandra will well turn over a mountain, even though it looks like a raging ravine. All Duke can do is pass the turn back. Nathan knows what he's drawing, it's a copy of Karanos. So you know he's going to deploy that pretty quickly. Tectonic Edge, he might play. But again, Tectonic Edge in this situation is just a mountain because of the Blood Moon. But at some point, Reed may blow up the Blood Moon. Yep. And then you would want to have the Desolate Lighthouse, in it, or excuse me, the Tectonic te Edge to potentially discard. Absolutely. Although now with Raging Ravine in play, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of complexity. Here is Karanos, got a Storms. Pass the turn back. Now this is what the twin players go to after sideboard, especially in this matchup. Duke has some real difficulty of getting this card off of the table. Sometimes in Jun signboards, you'll find a card like Unravel the Aether or some other unique effect to get this off of the table. But it doesn't look like Duke has one of those. Yeah, I think Karanos is just here to stay against Reed 75. And they can run away with the game. We talk about how Chandra is a source of card advantage. Yes. Karanos is a source of card Not advantage. Not only is it a source of card advantage, it locks out a lot of Reed's threats. Yeah. And Nathan's had a pretty healthy life total and again has roast in hand. Not anymore. Duress will take care of that. Gonna leave Holiday with that Tectonic Edge. Chandra's ticking up. Reed would like to keep that alive. Pass the turn back. We're gonna head back Holiday's way. There's Remand. He knows that's coming. So Karanos will reveal that. Deal three damage over to Chandra. Looks like Holiday's gonna keep holding on that Tectonic Edge. No reason to really play it at this point. See how Duke wants to use Chandra, as this might be the last turn he gets to have it. Yep. I mean, Reed would have to run really well for Chandra to be able to take up the four. So I think he's just probably going to be zeroing here for as long as it stays in play. I think he's got a little bit of a question here for the judge. So if we can find out what that is, we'll of course let you guys know. Getting a little bit of clarification. 
The zero is a thought seize. I think Reed may be asking what happens if a spell that I reveal to Chandra gets thought, uh, gets remanded. Sure. Yeah, that was the question, is if this card gets exiled by remand. The answer is no. Remand will push it back to the hand. There are interactions where if remand does counter something, it doesn't go back to the hand. You think of flashback. flashback. Yep. yep. Scalding Tarn is revealed, which means that Holiday gets to draw that card. When you reveal land of Karen, she actually gets to draw another card. So when it's a spell, you get to bolt something. And when it's a land, you get to draw another card. Chandra zero. There's a Verdant Catacombs. There's Thoughtseize. Nathan says, look at all these sweet lands I have. Nothing doing here. Catacombs under the battlefield. It's just a mountain, of course. And Holiday will reveal Lightning Bolt. Bye-bye, Chandra. It's now Lightning Bolt in hand, along with three lands. Holiday will play one of them in Tectonic Edge. And, and this, is the, back. this is the game plan from Nathan post -board. Oh, yeah. It's just counter spells, card advantage, and a late game card like Karanos that's just so hard for Reed to answer. Sulfur Falls the reveal, Lightning Bolt the draw. Sulfur Falls will enter the battlefield, pass that turn back over to Duke. That's a discard spell in Inquisition of Kozlek. Wouldn't be surprised to see two, two Lightning Bolts go upstairs. It looks like he's just going to let him have one. Karanos will reveal a roast, going upstairs. Holiday will pass the turn back. Duke will draw. Another discard spell. This time, Thoughts These. Thoughts These, excuse me. Holiday will show the hand, since you can take Roast or you can take Lightning Bolt. It's your call. Lightning Bolt's going to bite the dust. The reveal is a Pestermite. Three damage. And no reason there for Nathan to bolt in response. Reed may want the roast instead, and Nathan is just very happy with the pacing of this game right now. Liliana was the draw, but Duke can't cast it. Only one swamp in play. He'll try for a Pestermite. And this isn't a Pestermite where it's like, I'm trying to split between you. This is just a, I'm just got a Pestermite. I want to get two points of damage. This is Reed's at seven, Pestermite. Yeah. <laughs> Terminate took care of that. Steam vents the draw. Jace Architect of Thought. Oh, look at us. Yep. It's old standard now. And he's got the necessary mana to cast it, thanks to those two islands. So there is Jace. Haven't seen this one for quite a while, that's for sure. We see one copy of this in a lot of, a lot of Splinter Twin sideboards. It's much of the same recipe, just have something that generates card advantage that's tough to get off the table. And look at Reed's graveyard. You're seeing a bunch of removal spells. Yep. You're seeing a lot of discard. You're not seeing cards that are particularly good against sources of card advantage once they enter play. And Nathan has really de-emphasized how much his creatures matter post-board. Jace is going to tick down for the mini factor fiction. It'll be a Cryptic Command versus Electrolyze and Spell Pierce. Well, looks like Holiday is going to side with the Cryptic Command. Hard to pass one of those up. Yeah, it's really good when you can cast it, <laughs> which yes. Nathan can. There's a Steam Vents, that'll end a Battlefield tap. We'll go back Reed's way. Reed with a Thought Seize is going to go down to five. Cryptic Command and Roast are the options. Reed getting information, he's going to concede the game out the door. Yep. Interesting there, in the position they got into, Blood Moon doesn't actually lock a lot of uh, Reed's deck except for the Raging Ravines, naturally. But Reed there at the end with Lilian of the Veil and Corsair Crufix in hand. Yep. Two cards that don't operate in that spot against Blood Moon. Now, once you'll note, as Reed immediately went back to the sideboard, so he wants to change something, it seems. Well, I'm not sure exactly how much removal he wants to keep in the deck. The problem is Nathan still had Deceiver, Exarch, and Pestermite in his deck. He showed both. Yep. So it's hard to be sure that Nathan's gotten away from the combo entirely. Are there four copies of Splinter Twin in Nathan's deck? I would be stunned. But is there one? Is there two, maybe? Very realistic that's the case. And that makes sideboarding from Reed's position pretty challenging. With that said, I think Reed's in the market for a little more aggression, a little less removal, because Nathan played the card advantage game very well, and Reed was just not able to apply sufficient pressure or card advantage of his own in that game. This is what makes playing both with and against twins such an interesting and fascinating experience. You know, as the twin player, you can kind of juke your opponent a little bit. I remember playing against this deck in a local PTQ 
three years ago or so. And the deck, the deck was eight copies of Deceiver XR plus Pestermite plus Kiki Jiggies on top of the Twins. There really wasn't the ability to convert into a deck like this at the time. Now the combo is de-emphasized. You see a lot more cards like Cryptic Command, Snapcaster Mage, Electrolyze. It just allows the deck to play a natural game. That's very helpful for, for game one because you can actually play back it against an opponent with disruption for you. And also post-board, if you want to bail on the combo altogether and just become a blue-red control deck, your game one setup means that it requires fewer sideboard slots to do that. These players are going to shuffle up here for game number three. That'll be underway in just a moment. We'll quickly talk about the player championship. We're at the Season 2 Invitational, which means we're going to be punching two tickets there. But the Season 1 Invitational, I think we remember it very, very well. Jacob Wilson, your champion, actually beat Reed Duke in the finals. And then number 84, JD. Mm -hmm. At right wing, number 84, Jim Davis, the Season 1 point leader, had a very good run throughout Season 1, uh, including the Open in Dallas. A lot of good success in the IQ circuit. Uh, he was the runaway leader for the point invite. And Jacob Wilson with a very memorable run at the Season 1 Invitational, defeating uh, Reed Duke in the finals. Of course, the Players' Championship is December 19th and the 20th. Three players qualified right now. Jacob Wilson, Jim Davis, and defending champion Brad Nelson. we got to punch two more tickets to Roanoke for the end of the year. And if you have not been to StarCityGames.com yet today, on the select side of the website, you will find the Players' Championship structure, which is pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, we've announced it. Uh, there's some updates. It's, it's essentially the same thing, although we've shifted around a couple things. Most importantly, all three constructed formats. Standard, Modern, and Legacy will be represented at the Players' Championship this year. Yeah, the representative of the Open Series this year. Might as well have him in the biggest tournament of the year. So a lot of cool stuff going on there. Definitely head over to the website and check that out after the match is over. Mm -hmm. Don't leave right now. It's game three. Okay. A couple Grand Prix champs. Yes. Might want to hang out. In what is really one of the defining matchups of the format. Absolutely. And I, I think so far you've, you've seen uh, two pretty standard games here. Uh, Reed's removal making it too hard for Nathan to win game one and game two Nathan Cyborg really coming out to play Now here's a hand that Nathan kept a pester might have been dealing like a lightning bolt along with the Jace architect of thought and a Karanos But only two lands no cantrips either now He certainly got some powerful cards that led to his win in the last game in Jace and Karanos lightning bolt is a great card against our confidant But maybe that's the reason that Reed is selecting it exactly if, if Reed follows this up with Dark Confidant and Nathan doesn't top deck an answer very quickly, that could be the opening that Reed needs to take this game. Just run away with it with card advantage and then his disruption, then his discard spells, his removal spells, they become very powerful against Nathan's hand. Reed will search up a swamp with that Verdant Catacombs. Again, because he saw Blood Moon in the last game, he does have to search for some basics, you imagine, with these fetch lands. He does have Verdant Catacombs and Bloodstained Mire in the deck. So there's the basic swamp. Here's a Dark Confidant. Reed hoping for no answer to the powerful creature. Holiday will draw. It's a copy of her man. That's not an answer. Nathan considering playing Steam Vents or Sulfur Falls here. He'll give away a little bit of information by playing the Sulfur Falls. Steve, excuse me, Reed knows about the Steam Vents in hand. Reed will reveal a Bloodstained Mire, so no damage dealt from the Dark Confidant. But this is close to an ideal opening here from Reed. I think he has another discard spell in hand, more threats. This is a, a very good recipe. And now with Bloodstained Mire, he has the ability to get to red mana if he was missing it before. Dark Confidant can, of course, tie the room together very nicely and start getting in some damage, too. There is the Bloodstained Mire. In comes the Confidant. Hod is going to go down to 18. And now here's a Thought Seize to clear the way or at least attempt to. These discard spells are so powerful in Jund. Yeah, and now Nathan presented with some awkwardness against with this remand. The remand may eat a mana from Reed this turn and cause Reed to not be able to follow up with a play, but if Reed was not going to use that mana anyway, you burning a remand here is pretty rough. I think Nathan's just in a market for land drops anyway. So I... I think that I would I would likely remand here. Because if Reed takes it, follows up with another play, and you miss a land drop next turn, it's bad news, but... He's going to let it resolve. Yeah. Nathan missing land number four has land number three. And so didn't feel the immediate need to cycle off the remand. And Reed is going to select the remand with the thought seize. So everything was remand-centric there. Reed got to search up a swamp yet again with that Bloodstained Mire. We'll have a play here in just a moment. Could be a Tarmogoyf, maybe a Scavenging Ooze, maybe even another Dark Confidant. Who knows? Mm -hmm. 
It'll be Tarmogoy. So we'll get the sizing on that in just a moment as Holiday does draw a copy of Stomping Ground. He'll place the events untapped. Down at 16 he goes. And now we're working into a different phase of the game. Or maybe it's the I Hope I Peel Splinter Twin phase of the game. This is really the type of of draw that Reed needs given the way that Nathan sideboarded. Reed no longer has the edge in a long game he had game one. And we saw in game two when it got protracted, Reed's discard spells weren't able to handle things like Karanos and, and Jace and Snapcaster Mage. But a little bit of discard backed up by some pressure, that's a very good recipe. There's a little bit more discard, third discard spell of the game. You saw Duke reveal Forest to Dark Confidant. And now here's an Inquisition as Reed like to, would like to get a better look at Holiday's hand. One thing that Reed doesn't have yet, or at least it seems he doesn't have, is red mana. But he's had the opportunity to search for red mana if he wanted to. He might be slow rolling it here for a little bit because he didn't want anything to happen to it from an Exarch or Pestermite effect. We'll find out momentarily, but I, I suspect because Reed fetched for a Swamp Blaster and he has the ability to get red mana somehow. Well, you are not correct. Oh. The, uh, I, I was thinking the same thing with the Bloodstained Mire, I'm searching up the Swamp. You see the hand, it's a Forest, an Abrupt Decay, a Liliana, and a Lightning Bolt. I'm not one to say that Reed Duke made a mistake because he's cold and calculating. I can't imagine that was a mistake, but no red mana, no ability to cast a lightning bolt. A little strange. Yeah. One blood crypt in the deck could have gone and still had access to black mana. Yeah. Liliana gets cycled away from the Vendillion Clay. I suppose with Abrupt Decay in hand, there's no immediate need for him to get it. And if he was worried about the Liliana getting locked out Oof. via Blood Moon, ugh. A good draw from the Duke. Liliana, the draw to the Vendillion Click, which he was able to deploy, kill the Vendillion Click with the minus. Now he comes across with Tarmogoy and Dark Confidant. That's a momentum changer right there. Uh, I mean, Nathan was already up against the ropes here because even if he uh, was able, if Reed missed on that draw step, he's still looking at abrupt decay in a big clock, but very tough for Nathan to have that landing come off the top there for Reed. Snapcaster makes the draw. Can get back Lightning Bolt if he'd like, but the Tarmogoyf is pretty big, causing some real trouble here. Snapcaster plus Bolt is not a shabby turn. The problem still from Nathan's side is how is he going to answer this Tarmogoyf in time? Yeah. He needs to get to Roast very quickly. Roast would certainly be helpful, but now Reed's starting to come from different angles. He's got a car drawer out there in Dark Confidant. He's got a big beater out there in Tarmogoyf, and well, Liliana, that just causes all sorts of trouble. Yeah, it, Nathan is definitely getting squeezed from a bunch of directions here. And what Liliana also does is squeezes Nathan's plays, too, because, you know, Reed has a card in hand that he's happy to discard Lightning Bolt at this point. Confidant will be providing some fuel, we believe, as long as it stays on the table for Reed, as far as options are concerned, to what to discard. And for Nathan, well, he's not generating a lot of cards, so, you know, he's in this squeeze of, I'd like to get to Jason Karanos like last game, but you're picking apart my hand. Another problem here is that if that Liliana goes to the graveyard, that means now that uh, the... Tom McGuif is a 5-6, and now Roast is even an answer. Yep. And I think that's why Nathan had a debate there for a while, but ultimately I think he needs to give himself an opportunity to draw to Roast. And for that to work, the Liliana can't be in the graveyard yet. And that's where the problem also comes in now, too, because you talk about Liliana dying, that's another card in the graveyard, because right now we have land, sorcery, instant, and creature. That's a 4-5. Well, if an enchantment goes in there, Karanos, yep. or a Planeswalker, Jace, it is out of Roast range. And Nathan did discard his copy discard of Karanos. Karanos. Yeah. Yep. So that Tarmogoyf gets a little bit bigger, which both players will realize here momentarily. And now we are out of roast range. With Cryptic Command in Nathan's deck, he's never locked out. Locked yeah. out, there's always draws and sequences of draws, but uh, he's in some bad shape right now. Two turn clock and uh, no answer to Tarmogoyf in sight. Abrupt Decay takes care of that Snapcaster Mage, making Tarmogoyf into a one turn clock. Serum Visions, Little Scry action. You saw the draw was a Misty Rainforest, but that's not really going to help here because he can play Jason plus it, but he's got to crack the Misty Rainforest to do it, which means he goes down to four. Tarmogoyf is a five-power creature. The Jace trigger makes it a four-power creature, which is immediately Nathan Holiday's life total. Reed Duke is going to win this match here over Nathan Holiday. Two games to one. Jund will take care of Blue-Red Twin. It's a great start for the Duke and an Invitational yet again. Great start, and I, I, I like those...